potential towards the aim of national reconstruction. We, as a organization, have been striving to bring together talents and minds of the country and to use in them the nation first attitude. A solution oriented process and to inspire young I mean, I to develop the collaborating with institutions, individuals, and enterprises. We at Think India have tried to ensure maximum opportunities for the students and professionals in our network to develop and contribute in various dimensions. This time, Think India has collaborated. Chanakya National Law University, Patna. Talking about Chanakya National Law University, it is a national law university situated in Patna, one of the autonomous national law university among 23 other national law universities. Chief Justice of Patna High Court is the ex official chancellor of the university, and the current vice chancellor is Justice Retired Midura Mishra. Our motto is Yan Dhanam Mahadhanam. Is knowledge is the greatest right. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker for today's seminar. G. Sir is the National Law University of Bangalore, 1997 graduate. He is also a former Nagaland Advocate General and Senior Counsel. Sir is the youngest of three new additional Solicitor General in India. He's the first NLU graduate to make it to this post. We welcome you, sir. You may have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Supriti. I don't think I'm the youngest anymore. I think there are younger people who are additional to of this country. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, though. Uh, I thank Think India for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, on Swamiji, who's very, very close to my heart, and um, you know, who I have spent a lot of time being inspired by, and uh, I'm sure like a lot of other people. So what could be a better day uh, to speak on Swamiji than this? And, um, you know, it is, I would, uh, it is incredible that uh, so many of us have gathered to, to hear about Swamiji and, uh, I thank Think India again for giving me this opportunity to speak about Swamiji. Now, when Think India actually asked me, approached me to speak about Swamiji, um, you know, I was a little, uh, a little unhappy because, uh, you know, I continuously, on, and I said this, you know, I'm asked to speak about Swamiji very, very often. And on a number of occasions, I have spoken about Swamiji, and there is very little, you know, you can add new to what Swamiji said. And, uh, you know, it, all, it almost gets, uh, in some ways, repetitive. But then, as, but then on second thoughts, when I sort of applied my mind and uh, decided to speak on the topic, and I said that I will speak on the topic, I thought that it's time that we sort of as lawyers, because I'm a lawyer, look at Swamiji, which is not beyond the ordinary circumstances that we are used to, as in Swamiji was a great religious figure, was a figure who concentrated on man-making, which all he did, um, which are great things about Swamiji too. But we also think about Swamiji and sort of what are, the constitutional values, and we try to see what Swamiji said and uh, how does it match up to our constitutional values which are incorporated into the Constitution. And uh, so I decided to take up and, and speak on this. Uh, I hope you find the talk interesting, and I hope some of you are, as a result of this talk, get inspired to uh, maybe study uh, Swamiji a little bit more, and because he's an incredibly inspiring person to study, uh, because of two reasons. Number one, because he achieved all this at the age of 39, and he was he was gone after that. So it is tremendous achievement to to write so much, to do so much, to inspire so many people in India and outside, and then be gone by 39. It's, 
it's so incredible, so incredible that it almost seems, if you believe in that, you almost seems, um, you know, you could be an avatar, only an avatar could do that. And I'm, and I'm speaking, it's in some ways, great people in the world have always been, uh, have been very young. They say the same thing about Shankaracharya, they say the same thing about, uh, about Jesus Christ. Uh, similarly with Swamiji, you know, great people, uh, you know, achieve inhuman things uh, when, and especially when they're divinely inspired when they're very young. So to that extent, I would say that uh, that is one reason. And uh, the second reason why I always recommend Swamiji, because Swamiji still resonates to us, because uh, Swamiji is a person who is uh, deeply uh, Indic, and deeply immersed in Bharatiya tradition, culture, spirituality, and also uh, in many ways, very modern, very uh, off today's world. He confronts today's problems, he analyzes today's problems, he comes up with answers to today's problems, which are sometimes so modern and, and so incredibly perceptive that you would be wondering, if you, if you go through his writings, that. You know, how could someone uh, write this 120 years back? Because, you know, nearly, uh, we are nearly 120 years from the day he passed away and or left the mortal coils of, of body and uh, became Brahmalin. So, you know, we, these are two reasons why I think he reverberates with us till today. And that's why, you know, I would like to sort of speak on this topic where I would uh, talk about what does Swamiji stand for us and how can we relate him to our lives, that's one, and how as lawyers, and number two, you know, what are the constitutional values which sort of have, we have in common with Swamiji? The first value, the first issue, and is the concept which I highlighted. Swamiji was, uh, was immersed in tradition, immersed in the in, in the spirituality of India, he was part of it. He was the direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahans, one of the great mystic saints uh, in the history of India, the greatest of, one of the greatest of them. And he was he had deep, very deep knowledge of Indian scriptures, uh, of of the reality of India, because he traveled as a wandering monk across the country. But he was also deeply modern. Uh, he was deeply modern in in uh, in his outlook, in his way he perceived the world, in the way he saw the new world. And in fact, uh, so much is talked about New India today. I think the roots of the coinage of the word New India, and I'll come to that at the end of uh, my talk, comes to a speech which Swamiji said. And when Swamiji said that, you know, New India, what is New India? He said the New India, uh, whatever it is, will arise from, from the poor houses, from the house, from the hovel, uh, from the door of the fritter cellar, you know, from the streets. He said New India will not belong to, to the old, the old elite, the, the entitled uh, elite, with, as he used the, your jewel, fossil jeweled hand. Uh, it will not arise from that. And so that's, you know, Swamiji's, uh, what Swamiji spoke about. On the other hand, on the flip side also, Swamiji continuously also spoke about uh, that we are, uh, we are as Indians today are torn between what he termed two, two words which he used, between skila and charabdis, which is between the endless uh, material uh, existence, and materialness, material achievements of the West and its wonderful civilizational uh, things, benefits which one gets, and the deep spirituality which makes us Indians. And uh, Swamiji says that, you know, you, you can't be taken over completely by the West because if India, if India disappears, the world, uh, the existence of the world will be in trouble because India has so much to give to the world. We are, uh, we have so much to give, provide and give to the world. So, you know, this balance between tradition and modernity 
is what I think is one of the hallmarks of, of the Constitution as we know. Because the Constitution uh, takes a, it creates the modern state, creates the modern state, but keeps within it intact the nuances of, of Indian civilizational thinking, uh, whether it be in Article 15, which talks about the nuanced interpretation of the conception of, of different castes and jati, and how the you know, benefits should be given, and I'll come to that at a later point of time, what he had to say to that. Our conception of limited conceptions of freedom of speech under Article 19, our rights are interpreted by the court under Article 21, which gives uh, a right to life, it's not mere life, but a mere animal existence, but hugely encompasses everything, right to lead a good life. And Article 32, which allows people to even write letter petitions to 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 the Supreme Court to get their remedies. Now, these are, uh, which keep in many ways, these are uh, conceptions of Indian jurisprudence, conception of, of justice, which so pervades the constitution, is as I, as I am fond of telling everybody, is a translation of the old idea of dharma, because the only constitutional legal uh, equivalent of the word justice we have today is, is dharma. In, you know, that in which holds things together, that which is just. So in many ways, we retain the, the spirit of India and we've created a modern state. So this balance, I think, is uh, resonates uh, greatly with Swami, Swamiji's thought. Uh, the other, and something which is greatly discussed and something which I touched on a little earlier is the conception of liberty. Now, uh, Swamiji, I don't know how many of you know, was was very fond of, of liberty. And he was so fond of liberty that he actually wrote a poem dedicated to the 4th of July, which was the American Independence Day. Uh, because he said, because he found many parallels with the conception of liberty and the path of moksha, which, uh, which Indians, uh, which is an integral part of Indian thought. He said, uh, you know, there are, Liberty is about pursuit of happiness, that you, you know, improve yourself. Liberty is about improving oneself. And he felt that the same thing of individual liberty, and he, and he felt the same thing about achieving moksha by an individual. So he was, again, deeply fond, and that is one integral part of his thinking about, about the world. Uh, the third is the concept of ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti, which he continuously says and on various parts of his writing, uh, which he says that is the keystone arch of, in, of India, which means that uh, ekam sat, there is one truth, where the wise call it by very many names. And uh, that is the great diversity which we will try to preserve in, in our constitution, that you can have diversity of views, you can have diversity of beliefs, you can have a large number of diversity in your religious practices, uh, because as we all know, even this country of, is of great variance of religious practices. I come from Bengal. I have you know, very unique religious practices. Uh, people from uh, Punjab have very different religious practices, which are uniquely different. In fact, within states, there are so many different. I can, I can vouch for it, that within states, uh, within groups of people, there are there are so many variations, there are so many differences, so many languages, so many uh, cultural groups, so many uh, societal institutions which are completely different. Yet we work today as a, work together as a society, work together as a, a culture, as a civilization, as a religion, as, as so many other things. So he said that there is one truth. Remember, the truth is one. But, you know, why is called by different names? So this entire concept of shorthand of what is used very frequently these days is concept of concept of um, unity and diversity is a shorthand and I don't think which it expresses the truth of this sentence. Uh, this is of course from the Upanishads and uh, Swamiji on number of occasions stressed you know that we should sort of be you know that should be the key understanding of anyone who tries to understand India. Uh, the fourth thing which I think has great resonance in constitutional law and constitutional values is the importance of reason. Uh, you know, Swamiji, unusually, and this is extremely unusual for someone, a man of such deep faith of great spirituality, 
uh, continuously stressed on, he said that, you know, continuously stressed on reason. He continuously said on a number of occasions, you know, very frequently that whatever you have, you have to test it on reason. Whatever, if it's the truth, you have to test it on reason. If it is a faith, you have to test it, test it on reason. If it doesn't work, you have to discard it. Um, he was, uh, you know, deeply, deeply um, a believer of reason as a, as a driver of society. And that is why I think, you know, one of the great constitutional values which we have today is, is, is reasonability of the ability to reason, of the fact that everything should be tested, everything should be reasoned, everything should have reasons uh, for arriving at conclusions. And so I think that, you know, this has deep, deep resonance in, in Swamiji's thoughts. Uh, now comes to the fifth part. I think this is a little bit controversial, but I'll, I'll try to talk about it. And I, and I touched on right at the beginning of my of my talk that uh, you know the entire concept of Swamiji spoke about. Um, uh, Swamiji was faced with the question as to whether he was a socialist or not, and this question was. And he said that he wasn't. And Swamiji expressly, I'm sure, knew what socialism was because his brother, Bhutranath uh, Dotto, was one of the founder, one of the founders of the Indian Communist Party, and, and a sub, one of the first early members of the Indian Communist Party. So he knew what socialism was. Uh, but he said that he, he's a number of occasions. He said that he wasn't. He said, if you achieve complete equality, then you are basically, in many ways, and dead. Uh, but he, in fact, he made a very perceptive comment, and which I think is uh, was clearly unusual for a person of, in his times and age. And he said that I equate a grihastha who makes money for distribution in the world, who makes money for distribution in the world, as holy or as uh, as as sacred as a monk praying in his in his cell. Uh, so you know, he was greatly, greatly. Uh, for uh, the idea that money, which is important in this world, to generate money is important because the mon that money is used for betterment of society. Uh, you know, on very many occasions, and this I'm sure you, you, all of you have heard, uh, Swamiji stressed on the fact that you can't have religion on an empty stomach. He, he continuously said that you have to look after the poor. You have to have sympathy for the poor. You have to ensure that the poor are uplifted, that the lot of the poor has to be looked into. Uh, in related to that is the next point of uh, Swamiji's deep belief in, in social justice. Um, you, know, you know, all of us know that Swamiji on a number of occasions said that you have to uh, you know, awaken the poor, awaken the disempowered, awaken the unempowered. He used the word shudra jagaran as, as, as an integral part of, of, uh, of his thoughts, that you have to awaken the shudra. And shudra here, he not only meant the conception of jati, because he had a different analysis of, of, uh, of, of, varna, of varna, the conception of varna, but he said of the poor, you have to awaken them because it is in their awakening that um, the final, uh, you know, the uh, final realization of the destiny of India can only happen. Uh, he said this a number of times, but uh, he had a very nuanced understanding, and this is an understanding which I, I think pervades the constitutional framework, where he said the biggest struggle. He said the biggest struggle in this world is is against privilege, is against the accumulation of privilege. He said throughout history, the, the greatest struggle has been against the accumulation of privilege, so that everybody who ever comes into power accumulates privilege. And once they accumulate privilege, uh, then they become more and more powerful and they exploit the other person completely. He said, you know, uh, the only way that you can get away, get rid of Inequality, inequality in society. He said there can be no perfect equality. The only way you can get rid of this inequity in society is to get rid of privilege. And he said 
that struggle is a continuous struggle, and that is a struggle which we have to uh, go through. And he continuously stressed another thing. He said, those who are privileged, it is up to them to ensure that those who are not privileged are brought up to their level. I think if anyone who looks at the uh, conception of reservation which we have in our constitution, and I, and I say this a number of times, uh, you know, almost the seeds of that idea come off what Swamiji said. And uh, in effect, what Swamiji said and what, you know, the wordings of it may, may come from something that it's very close to Ramon Ohar Luya. I don't know how many of you read Ramon Ohar Luya, uh, but uh, it is, uh, you know, the roots of it can completely be traced uh, to thinking of Swamiji, who, who spoke about that, you know, you have to get rid of privilege. You have to bring people up rather than uh, get people down. Uh, the most interesting observation, which, uh, and this is a controversial, again, statement which I'm going to make. This comes from a study which I, I did, uh, my reading of, of, of the works of Swamiji. So Swamiji was once put this question as to, you know, how does caste in India end? And he very interestingly answered, the caste in India will end with free market. He said that, you know, once you have free market, people rise to their own level. So people are not then tied to the job which they have been doing for centuries, but do the job which they're, which they're good at. And once you have the market itself will ensure that this happens. Now, who would have thought this is the idea which, you know, people in the Dalit community now very frequently argue. But who would have thought that uh, this idea could come in 1898? And these are, these are Swamiji's own words. Uh, uh, another of Swamiji's um, very perceptive comments, very perceptive comments is something which we very frequently discuss nowadays. You know, who of our these are democracy? Uh, Swamiji, and you have to realize that he died in 1902, so he, 120 years back, is, he addressed the question, he's gone to Britain, he's gone to America, he addressed the question of, uh, of democracy. And he had a very perceptive, but very strong criticism of democracy. He said that what you've done in democracy in the West is that you have basically created a, a rule whereby people who rule in the name of the people, but it, you know, they drive the poor against the wall. Democracy is in, in the West has only benefited the rich and the rich have taken the maximum benefits out of the system. And on the wall, the, he said the poor have been driven to the wall and being sent to, you know, driven to alcoholism, driven to great and deep poverty and social, uh, and this is something which we can see today. Uh, you know, this is, a, a, this is one of the broad criticisms of democracy which is happening throughout the world. Uh, if anyone sort of sees uh, the criticism of, of democracy which is happening in America, it is on those lines that the benefits Seem to me, seems to be in democracy at the present moment in highly developed Western countries to have been cornered by uh, elites and people who are wealthy and the benefits of democracy are not percolating down to the poor. And this is something which he said you know, 120 years back. Uh, you know, as an aside and as, uh, you know, as an aside or a conclusion of this part of, of constitutional values of, of Swamiji, I would to like to stress on that, you know, what, what was the objective of Swamiji? What is the objective of the Constitution? Uh, the objective of the Constitution, as I said, is to, is to have social justice. It has, to, it has to get rid of privilege, which is permeating that of the Constitution at various different levels. Uh, you know, Swamiji analyzed the history of the world in his own reading of the world world history in by sort of categorizing it in four different phases the first he said was the age where brahman qualities overruled then there was uh shatriya quality then vaishya and then he said finally we are going to uh shudra uh, uh, shudra age and he said that we have to work towards we to reaching the shudra age shudra age is a, is the age of of 
of the unempowered, of the disempowered, is the age when the disempowered will uh, will be powerful and they will have a word, they will have a say in, in governance of, of, of society. He classified the world, uh, the age which we are in, as he said that it was uh, a Vaishya age. He said that there are, and he, he throughout uh, analyzing all these ages, he said every one of them, and he set out it in great detail, he set out what were the good points and what were the bad points of this age. He analyzed them you know, in great detail. He said the great sort of advantage of the, of the Vaishya age, you know, in the Brahmin age had these disadvantages, positive points, negative points. Kshatriya is these are disadvantages, positive, negative. And he says, we are now in the Vaishya age. He said the, uh, the great advantage of, of the great, great thing about the Vaishya age is that, uh, you know, businesses take knowledge to every corner of the world. Uh, and he said, that's a great thing. But he says, on the other hand, it is businesses who, which control kings. It is businesses which controls intellectuals. And, and it, it is extremely exploitative. I think all of us who live in the world today will, will see that uh, it, it resonates so much. It resonates so much with us. It resonates so much with the truth. And he said the solution, so he said, what is the solution to this? He said the solution is to move towards the Shudra age, which he identified is with the people of the poor, of the unempowered, of the disempowered in the world. And he said, therefore, you have to awaken uh, the Shudra. You have to awaken the poor, the disempowered, and, and ensure that they have a stake in governments. He said that he could see the rumblings of this. He could see its... Uh, it has it is happening, but he said that you know we have to work. It is incumbent upon all of us to work towards this. Uh, but of course, he, he you have to realize this. It's a very nuanced understanding. He, he doesn't talk about a proletariat revolution. Uh, he does talk about that uh, you know the solution, the methodology of this is to get rid of privilege as much as we can. That being said, that is the first part of it, and. Uh, uh, now, the second question, and this is, with, with saying this, I will try to wrap up. Uh, you know, how should we, how can we get the values of Swami Vivekananda in our lives as, as lawyers? Um, how relevant is he as for a lawyer? And, you know, I'll just flag two or three things. I think um, one of the great things of Swamiji is that he always believes that one should stand up for what one thought is right. Anyone who uh, goes through his life knows that he really, really stood up for that. He suffered for that. He, you know, he, he was greatly targeted for that, but because he believed in that, he stood up for, for what he believed in. So you know, it's important for us as lawyers to stand up for what, you know, for what we think is right. He said, you know, he also was deeply proud of his tradition of his tradition of being an Indian, of, of his faith, of his spirituality, of being Hindu. And I think he said that a number of times. I think we should all be proud of, proud of that. That's extremely important of being proud of who you are. Uh, a part of it is that he, he spoke that you have to be spiritual. The great, great contribution of India to the world, he always stressed, was spirituality. Uh, so I think that's a great thing which we can incorporate in our lives. But on the third, third issue is something which we shouldn't forget and something which uh, does not permeate the discussion of uh, Swamiji, which we often do, but I think is extremely important. He said that you have to be rational. He said, test everything on rationality. If it doesn't stand the test of rationality, discard it, however uh, holy, however, you know, of deep faith it may be. Uh, so, you know, so, uh, you know, that's extremely important. You have to test everything on rationality whether it stands the test of reason. Uh, another thing which we can bring is something which Swamiji uh, spoke about a number of times. He said, you know, fall for don't touch it. Don't, you know, do everything. You know, don't reduce your, uh, the way you view the world. Don't reduce your religion, as he said a number of times to the kids. Do this, don't do that. He said, you know, don't touch me. He said, you know, religion is, your religion, your spirituality is much more wider than and uh, that is 
I think that is a great lesson to be learned. Uh, third is, uh, you know, the whole concept as I spoke about, number, number, not third, number one of the concepts is, is the concept of that we, in our lives, in our everyday life, especially today when society is so diverse, we have to learn to respect diversity of people from different parts of, of our culture, of our traditions, of, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we have to realize that. Uh, we tend to not. We tend to believe in the truth of what we say. We tend to believe that uh, that we we carry the soul truth. He said, you know, there is one truth, no doubt, but you can approach the truth in a number of different ways. Uh, the, the other the, the other main thing which Swamiji spoke about and something that we can incorporate in our lives is the spirit of service. And Swamiji said that you have to see God in every human being. You have to treat Shiva as Shiva. It's not some charity that you are doing. He said a number of times, it is that you are doing worship by, by serving the people. Right? And, I, and I think as lawyers, we can uh, inculcate that in our lives. I think that will not only uh, help us to have empathy and sympathy, but also uh, bring us closer to the spiritual path that we all you know, sort of want to. Uh, because it's extremely important, because as he always said a number of times, that you have to, uh, when you look at the poor, you don't generally you know, want to do something for them. Don't do it in, in, in a sense of charity. Do it in the sense of service. I think that's extremely important. And lastly, and lastly as lawyers, I think the great takeaway from Swamiji, um, you know, the great takeaway from Swamiji is that we should have empathy for those who are not empowered it can be the poor it can be the socially who are not empowered but we should have and must have a deep empathy for for the poor uh for 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 the unempowered for the uh, socially backward and you know this is something which we have to inculcate from swamiji's uh, teachings his views his writings uh, which i think would be uh, extremely important uh, for us in future as, as people, as individuals, as well as for the greater good of society that we live in. Now, in conclusion, uh, Swamiji wanted to create two things. He wanted to create, as I, as, you know, which is very often discussed these days, he wanted to create something which is called New India. Then we have to create a New India which has to uh, be created which will materially be strong. He said, and he always stressed it, that he will physically be strong, go and play football. Uh, you know, and he said a number of times, you can only achieve spirituality, you can only achieve spiritual growth once you're physically strong. So, you know, which could only, not only be um, materially strong, and he said a number of times, if, if material benefits, material civilization machines help me to feed the poor, I, I'm completely for it. And uh, he was not a person who said, you know, go back to your, uh, go back to, uh, to, a, to a distant past. He said that you have to ensure that your, um, the present is looked after. It's deeply modern in that respect, deeply of this age, uh, you know, in that respect. But he also spoke about, he also spoke about that we have to work towards an awakening, what he said a number of times, of Prabuddha Bharat, and he sort of, stressed in it. Uh, so Prabhupada Bharat means an awakened, an awakened India where all of us are awake, awakened India which is of, of both knowledge, deep, deep knowledge in science, in, uh, in, uh, in material benefits as well as in spiritual terms. So he said, you know, you can't only have spiritual benefits. But it is your greatest contribution to world civilization, no doubt. It is India's contribution of spirituality. But nonetheless, uh, it is extremely important that material benefits of, to the people, to the poor, have to be, you know, have to be given. And he said a number of times, you can't, and as I've said this again, uh, you can't have religion on an empty stomach. Um, you know, Swamiji talked about a, a, a strong India. He talked about an India in which those who are not empowered 
to have a say, and he talked about a strong society, but he also talked about a spiritually alive society. A spiritually alive society, which is conscious of its past and its traditions, and yet willing to take on the challenges of the new world, of the modern world, of the uh, scientific world, of the globalized world. Uh, because if there was the first truly globalized uh, Indian spiritual person, it was Swamiji who took Indian spiritual wisdom to the West and brought in conceptions of, of the Western world and Indianized it and, and, and sort of put out the challenges which Indian society faced from the West to India. Uh, he had a profound impact and a very profound impact on on the world, on the people around him. Some of the greatest freedom fighters were, were inspired by him, and I can go through a number of them, from Subhash Chandra Bose to Rajaji to uh, Aurobindo Ghosh to, you know, to, uh, you, you can name it, and they were all deeply, deeply inspired by uh, Swamiji, and Swamiji still remains a deep inspiration for all of us. Uh, because it is only through Swamiji, and Swamiji is the, uh, and I say this, and there may be others, but it is uh, Swamiji who uh, puts out and who lays the path for a new India. Uh, and uh, it is on that path which we are, which are proceeding on it, on our way today. And it is that path of new India and Prabhupada Bharat through which our redemption, our our not not only redemption, our our moksha as a as a so as a society as a country lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your enthralling session. We have some questions from the audience side. Uh, the question is, how effectively can apply teachings of Swamiji for making Atmanirbhar Bharat. I'm sorry, once more, could you repeat it once more? Uh, yes, sir. How effectively we can apply teaching of Swamiji for making Atmanirbhar Bharat? Ah, that's what I said. So I, I addressed this in, in the speech, so I, I can go through it again. I think uh, we can uh, approach it as in our daily lives and we can work towards the uh, uh, a truly, um, I would say, uh, in many ways, inculcate the values uh, in within us and try to, as I as I as I said, work towards promoting these values in society. Thank you, sir. Um, now I would like to thank Mr. Vikramji Banerjee, sir, for absolutely enthralling and insightful session. This is our honor and great delight that you spared time and graced us with your knowledge. I shall, we shall be forever in debt to you, sir. At last, I would like to thank all the participants, coordinators, and volunteers for turning up to this event and making it a success. Participants are requested to stay back as we announce the winners for the quiz. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank you all the participants. Uh, as we all know that on 12th of January to celebrate the birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda, we organized an online quiz competition named Swami Vivekananda, the youth icon of India. It's now the time to announce our winners. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for the contribution and hard work that they have done for the quiz contest. So coming to the winners, First prize goes to Mayank Roy. Second prize goes to Monica Joshi. And third prize goes to Anushri Parmar. There are 
10 other names which will be awarded with certification of merit. First is V. Proshan, Aditi Anand, Janvi Manjule, Pranav Maheshwari, Romil Aryan, Vikramaditya Agrawal, Ram Kumar, Vidhi Perival, Anurag Gupta, Ritik Dev, and Tejeswar Pandey. Great one, great work, guys. Um, beside this, all the participants shall be awarded with certificate of participation. We really appreciate your participation, guys. Congratulations to all the winners, and thank you again, everyone, for your great contribution. Thank you.